Good morning, everybody. My name's Vanessa Rogers and I'm a youth worker. Um, today, I've been asked to uh, talk to you a bit about the work I've been doing around young people, pornography, massive topic. But I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit about some of the ways that we could be supporting young people to look at what for some people can be quite an emotive topic. So I'm going to put it out there now. There are lots of different views on this. Uh, and the stuff that I'm talking about um, can be contentious. But you know what? Sometimes having those conversations with young people is exactly what we need to be doing. So uh, it's based on stuff I did for research. I did for a book called We Need to Talk About Pornography, which is published with, by Jessica Kingsley Publishers. I'm currently updating that. It was well, it was uh, written in 2016, but already things have changed. Uh, things have moved on, not least the national curriculum, which we're going to talk about in this. Um, and hopefully it's going to give you some ideas of ways that you can talk to young people about the impact and influence of pornography on things like relationships, body image, and generally how we feel about ourselves, mental health, all sorts of areas that it goes into. So I'll show you what I'm what I'm doing. A lot of the time I'm asking questions. I definitely am not saying I've got all the answers. OK, so hopefully it'll uh, get some of those conversations going and you'll find it useful. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen with you now. So bear with me a second while I do that. OK, um, pornography, even the very words can put fear into some people, you know, thinking this is not something I feel comfortable talking about. This is not something I know anything about. And, and I want to, again, put it out there now. There is absolutely no need to talk about your own porn, whether you watch it or you don't. Um, there is no need to be asking young people about what they have and what they haven't done. Although in my experience, I did quite a lot of um, focus groups for the book, getting doing trying out activities with young people, but also asking them about their values, their ethics, what they thought. And they were only kids too keen to tell me what they've been watching. So, you know, it might not be such a big of a surprise topic as you think it might be. Uh, and you might not be the only person having those conversations. And we're going to talk about school a little bit. Um, and then at the end, I'll, I'll give you some signposts to places that you could go find out more, hear more about it, to join the whole debate. You know, it's great. Um, again, pornography, nothing new. You know, we're not talking about something that is just arrived on the scene. And as I think I've hinted at, opinions really vary for all sorts of reasons. This could be about, you know, what you believe, how you've been brought up, family views, it could also be ethical views, it could be, you know, faith-based views, and that's okay, you know, we, we really need to be creating environments where it's safe for people to talk and explore how they feel and what they think without feeling they're going to either be shut down or criticised or vilified for those views. In the UK, if you are over the age of 18 and you choose to watch legal porn, you know, that is absolutely up to you. And there is certainly no judgments meant throughout this hour that I'm going to be with you, just probably just over an hour knowing me. Um, because, there, you know, that's not very helpful either. So this is not about judging people for what they do or what they don't do. Uh, the law protects children and young people in the UK and actually across the world. It's felt that it's not the best thing for children to be watching. And you know what? Great news. The national curriculum for RSE changed in 2020, which means we finally can be talking about what I think is a really important conversation uh, because it's there. It's, it's kind of what schools are doing, too. So have a look on the National Curriculum website. Definitely. I'm going to show you a little extract of it through here, but it's quite big, you know, talking about sexualized images and the mating, making, creating and consuming of pornography. Uh, and, you know, things change through the, through the years. So kind of the postcard on the right there is a bit of a joke, really, but it's part of a series from the BBC in the early days of television telling people uh, for directors and camera crews so they knew what was acceptable for the TV for the British watching public and what isn't and I mean I guess my first point really is to think about you can see there too much bust is revealed in this shot and consider that against maybe things images that we see 
on mainstream TV now, you know, we certainly wouldn't be thinking, oh, look, shock, she's adjusting her stockings in public. So views and, and, and values, well, just how people think about this has changed in a relatively short period of time. As I say, porn seems to have existed in some form or another. And you could say, you know, what's the problem? People like watching other people having sex. It's as simple as from when Pompeii uh, was covered in lava from the volcano. And finally, they dug bits out and discover what was underneath. Definitely evidence of early porn there through to cave dwellings, through to Debbie Does Dallas, if you're an 80s girl like me. I never saw it actually in the 80s, but certainly it was it was a much talked about video through to maybe some would say the kind of capitalization of things like BDSM through uh, books and erotic literature like Fifty Shades of Grey. So is it art? You know, the Kama Sutra is very beautiful. Is it art? Is it porn? Is it smut? What's the difference? And ultimately at the bottom line, does it matter? And that's kind of some of the things we're gonna be exploring looking at this. Um, so erotic images, beautiful images, the body, you know, teenagers and children being interested in bodies is perfectly normal. Adults being interested in bodies, perfectly normal. And if you look at something like this, th this is um, a Paul, a Peter Paul Rubens. And Rubens was really famous for his, his beautiful depictions of flesh and rounded women that were particularly thought beautiful in the time. And as you can see, that, that even in this, you know, um, virtual copy here, and it's not very high grade. You can see the beautiful use of brush strokes and color to depict muscle tone and flesh. You know, it is an erotic image. It, it, it's in terms of the fact that it, it's lavish and it's naked and it's, it's actually depicting a rape here. Um, so what is it about this? You know, he is considered, Rubens, one of the most influential painters of his time. Uh, and the whole Renaissance period is kind of reflective of that style of painting. So why is it all right for us to have that in art galleries? And, you know, we encourage maybe young people, children to go look at that. You know, it's a work of art. And what's the difference between that and something that's not OK to see, you know, for children? or that we would consider pornography and that was in my research that was kind of my starting point because and I have to say I changed my mind a lot of times during this as to which side you know I can see all sides of the argument I've probably read too many arguments now to have, have a valid opinion of my own I'm an amalgamation of everybody's which you might find yourself as well if you look into this but art or pornography it's a good starting point with young people to, to, to look at this um, and actually, it's about the definition. So I've put here the Oxford uh, Dictionary definition. Sometimes I get young people to define it. You know, pornography, it's about magazines, websites, DVDs that describe or show naked people. But the whole point of it is to arouse desire and for people to feel sexually excited. Um, I mean, I was surprised to see that, especially in a way that many other people find offensive. Again, even in the dictionary, we've got divisions in terms of definitions here. So the difference between a painting like the Rubens painting and maybe the Greek statues, the naked statues that you see in all their glory, is that they were not set up. The intention of them is not to arouse, sexually arouse, and pornography, that is its primary function. It's kind of shorthand, isn't it, to uh, get people in the mood quickly. That's the point of it. And you hear people say, but it's just everywhere. It's insidious. Everywhere you look, you know, you've got selfie culture and naked selfies and celebrity culture where celebrities are kind of creating their own porn or, or showing sexualized images. And or is it homemade porn? Is it about peer pressure, this pressure to look at stuff and create stuff? What is it that has changed so quickly? Uh, and any of those could be explored as to looking at how uh, the sexualization, for example, of the music industry. Has it always been there? Has it not? You know, is it worse? Does it matter? All those areas that we can talk about with young people 
Um, but what definitely is different is maybe accessibility. And it is not very hard for anybody to access whatever they want to see free of charge. Whereas step back a few generations and actually, you know, you've really got to go some to find it. You've either got to go to a specialist shop, you've got to maybe find a parent's stash of porn mags or come across it in some other way. It's a lot harder than perhaps it is for young people now who want to have a look, you just go online, put it in, and you will be inundated with choice. And it depends on your political, ethical views, whatever, as, as to what you think. Some people would argue, look, this is just harmless fun. It doesn't matter. Everybody knows that porn isn't the real thing. You know, it's a rite of passage that young people go through as they get older, they want to know about sex. And whether it's looking at, you know, um, mucky mags that you find over somewhere uh, or in a, a parent's stash of porn to actually going online with your friends or watching something online on YouTube, a video, it's just a rite of passage. Everybody does it. Some people say, look, it's part of throwaway society. It means it's nothing. It means nothing. Others would say, no, you know what? It's empowering. This is about people reclaiming. There is nothing wrong with it at all. And porn can be very empowering. And we're going to look a little bit at ethical porn and feminist porn. Others feel very strongly this is morally wrong. It is dangerous. It's harmful. It reinforces uh, stereotypes, uh, by showing women via the, the male gaze, there is nothing empowering about this. And, and some would go further and say, actually it's demeaning both to the men and women in it and those that watch it. So there is a whole load of stuff out there. And actually talking to young people to see where they sit on this is quite interesting. What do they think about it? You know, they've grown up in an age where porn is easy to look at. Um, definitely not all young people do. Definitely not all children do, but a, a growing percentage do. So what does the UK, what do we have laws around this? Well, it's very clear, you know, the age of sexual consent is 16. And that's been the same for a long time. It's illegal to buy porn if you're under 18. But, you know, most young people will tell you it's not very hard to access 18 oversights because actually the gateways aren't particularly policed and it's easy to get around those um, you know, things that are put in place to stop them. It's illegal to take uh, sexually explicit pictures and films of anyone under the age of 18, considered children. And that in includes if they're doing it themselves, so that youth produce sexual imagery, which I'm guessing most youth workers have already done quite a lot of work on with young people. When we look at it, staying safe online and social media and those kind of topics. It's also illegal to incite under 18s, either to make it or to watch it. And certainly those links with grooming and maybe online safety would, would say that's one, one way that, um, you know, potential children are potentially groomed by showing them images. Uh, but actually there's some porn and 2019 changed what that was slightly, but some porn still is illegal to watch, make or distribute at any age. And that includes things uh, like it used to be called snuff porn, so death, you know, things that are going to maim and harm. But they have changed slightly um, in terms of what those levels are. So definitely, if you haven't seen the law changes, go and have a look. Uh, and that includes things like graphic novel novels and gaming. Um, you know, using uh, some of those manga characters are, are very childlike in the way that they're drawn. And the idea being that showing children having sex with children is not OK. So it covers those those, those uh, areas as well. And you have to be careful. Uh, I mean, I know I've, I've told a few people this already, but my poor parenting may be letting three year olds watch uh, YouTube and I've put on an hour's worth of Peppa Pig while I can get on with work like everybody else has to. And suddenly I hear, oh, what's George doing? And as I look, George is running around after Peppa with a huge pink penis that has been, uh, you know, digitally attached to the to the Peppa Pig video. So it, he's everywhere, you know, taking uh, child things. There's cartoons you can see X rated versions of and simply by being within a children's, you know, something slipped through the net, I guess is what I'm saying. So we need to be vigilant with what children are actually watching, even though the law is there to protect them and keep them safe. So putting it into context, you know what? There is no incentive for people who make porn 
uh, to do much more than sit back and let the money roll in. It's globally worth an estimated, so on your last year's figures, 97 billion. That is such a lot of money. And 42 billion visits to Pornhub in 2019. And that is likely to be far higher for the 2021 figures, um, you know, during lockdown. That's about, works out, somebody's worked it out, it's about a thousand searches per second. And a quarter of all internet searches are for porn. Um, however, you know, putting that into context, it also means that 75% aren't. And um, some research says that the average time spent on a porn site is between six and 12 minutes. So again, just trying to put the other side there a little bit. Um, most search for terms on Pornhub in 2019 were lesbian, teen, stop mum, step mum, sorry, uh, mum and stepsister. So again, this, um, appetite this audience for very young looking people to be uh, in sexual images sexualized images and pornography uh interestingly YouGov did a survey in 2019 and they looked at people's attitudes to porn and asked them some actually some questions probably youth workers would like to ask young people and in the survey they found that one in ten men believe that porn is similar or very similar to real life sex. And I guess maybe that's where some of the concerns come in, that if adults think that, you know, what are young people thinking? How are they consuming how, and what are they absorbing whilst watching? So who watches it? Well, the majority are still male. Um, you know, that stereotype is still true, but there is a real rise in females watching and certainly, I think attitudes to women watching pornography have changed. 24% of visitors there to Pornhub are female. Um, and interestingly, from Marie Claire um, research that they did uh, in 2020, more than a third of 18 to 35 year old women said that they watch porn at least once a week. Once again, adults, you know, Adult consumption rates are interesting because we know that children, young people uh, learn from what they see, their lived experience. But maybe more concerning is the numbers of children, 11 to 14, and the NSPCC survey said that over half, 53%, um, have seen pornography. And more than that, it's what would have been deemed, uh, called in the old days, maybe hardcore pornography. So um, BBC Three did a, a, um, have done quite a few um, things on porn, uh, whether they're short programs or kind of researchy programs too. Um, and the one that they they said was, you know, fifty five percent of young men said porn had been their main source of sex education. And whatever you feel about pornography, you know, the general consensus is that pornography is not the best form of sex education. Um, because it, it's not giving a very balanced view. So, you know, certainly concerns there. So the national curriculum reflects these concerns and it changed, as I said, in 2020 to include online and media within, we've gone away from sex and relationships to relationships and sex, very much an emphasis on looking at positive relationships, consent, body image, how it feels, pleasure within sex, you know, looking at all those things and including looking at the impact of viewing harmful content. And, and as you can see, they are quite clear in their statements there, uh, specifically looking at sexually explicit material and the, the distorted picture of sexual behaviours that that can give to people. And, and if you think back, you know, on the slide I just showed you, one in 10 men believe that porn sex is similar or very similar to real life sex. I'm not sure that that's so, actually. I would say that that uh, porn sex is very different to real life sex. And, and that can damage how people see themselves and others, and it can change their behavior. Um, and in the survey, the YouGov survey, it went on to look at how many percentage of adults said that things they had seen in porn, they had tried to try out with, with um, with their partners, and then it looked at degrees of success and whether that was consensual. But interesting to see those. So have a look at that if you can. Um, and sharing and viewing indecent images of children is criminal and making sure that people understand that, 
that anything that's legal for adults is not necessarily so, and that the impact on, on a younger person can be very different to that as an adult. So with that in mind, part of my research, I went and asked people, you know, what do you get from it? So I asked adults, I asked 100 adults in true old style family fortunes um, way, why do adults watch porn? And then I asked young people, why do you watch porn? And for me, this is when the differences became apparent. So, you know, adults reasons include it's fun. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, and again, those stats, they're quite different in that 56% um, watch porn daily. Um, oh, sorry, 56% watch porn and 15% daily. And again, that's going to have risen during lockdown because we know those figures have changed. They talked about it's instant, you know, it stimulates erotic feelings. There's no emotions behind it. And certainly there's an argument about the importance of self-pleasure and understanding your own body so that you can go on to have good sex with a partner. Um, you know, you don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to consider anybody else. You can watch anything you want to watch, anything that does it for you without having to worry that you're harming somebody or hurting someone. I mean, you know, is that true? And of course, that's one of the other arguments is how do we know that the pornography that you're watching is consensual? How do you know that people are happy with it? How do you know, you know, all those people are real humans and they've got their own life and their own wishes, wants and needs as well. And maybe that doesn't get looked at quite so much when it's an image and you're just consuming. And it's so easy and it's free. So it's a free form of recreation. So then I asked young people a similar question. Well, I asked them exactly the same question. And their answers were very different. So for a lot of young women, and Annie there was happy to have her name to it, and um, she said, it's to learn how to have sex. That's what I watch it for. I want to see what you do because I don't want to feel stupid. Um, you know, I don't know much. I haven't had sex and I want to know what I'm supposed to do or, or what do I do when I've got a partner to make them happy, to, 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 to pleasure them. And lots of conversations about, well, you know what? You're supposed to feel pleasure too. It's not just about pleasure in a partner. Um, one young woman there echoed several that we spoke to, which was about my boyfriend wants me to. And this idea that maybe a lot of young women, it wasn't that they were reluctant, it was that their boyfriends were kind of selling it to them as something that all couples do. And the truth is some couples do, some couples don't. And Sam said, to compare bodies. I look because I want to see what other people's bodies look like. Uh, when it came to the young men and we asked them, they were clear. I mean, some girls echoed this as well. It teaches the bits that school leaves out. And there was a lot of conversation about how, you know, sex education in school wasn't good enough. And hopefully those changes to RSE mean we've got a real opportunity here to get it right. Some of the younger people, some young people said the first time they watched porn, they were actually quite disgusted. Maybe they felt quite uh, frightened. They found it very aggressive and, and it sort of played on their mind a bit. But there was another school that was like, it's funny. And it became a competition between fight between friends to show clips of what they thought was the most gross or the funniest, you know. But often their idea of funny was it was maybe um, older people having sex. Maybe it was um, somebody who was of... Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe disabilities was quite popular to laugh at, uh, laughing at people with larger bodies, laughing at people, you know, it was all about, instead of seeing it even as something erotic, it was about the shock factor and about using that because it was funny. So obviously quite a lot of work to do there to challenge that thinking, because you know what? Everybody's entitled to good sex, doesn't matter who you are. Um, and also a lot about just because my friends do, everybody does it. So therefore, you know, I don't want to be left out and I do it too. So some very different ideas of why people said that they looked at it. I mean, there were hundreds of ideas because I asked hundreds of people, but there were some clear themes there. Impact of lockdown. Well, definitely there has been a rise in online porn consumption, which I guess is, is not surprising, really, seeing as people have been stuck in their homes for a long time now. And we're all watching far more television, too. Um, but what was interesting to see here, and I guess in, I'm sure this has been uh, talked about in another of these 
um, around the rise in domestic abuse. And within that, those links to revenge porn and um, certainly the revenge porn helpline, good website to have a look at if you want to have a look at that, was saying that there's been a 22% rise in the number of people reporting uh, revenge porn where somebody has used what they felt well, they were intimate images that were supposed to be private and made them public it, it, as a way to humiliate, threaten, or um, generally upset people and making sure that you know young people know that that is illegal. So there is also this school of thought that COVID-19 crisis accelerated the commercialization of sexual intimacy. Um, and through that, what they were talking about was things like there's been a real sharp rise in um, things like sex toys, particularly, you know, but again, makes sense if people are on their own, uh, not everybody's in a, in a couple, or even if they are in a couple wanting to buy a sex toy, even when we were allowed only to buy the, uh, it, the essentials, that was still on Amazon's list. So, um, some people are saying, well, you know, we need to look a bit further at that, the rise of BDSM and whips and gags and stuff, and looking at that seems to have a direct link to Fifty Shades of Grey and that kind of erotic literature. And even though that was intended for over 18s, we know that lots of children and young people have read that. And actually, what messages is that giving? So again, lots of questions to ask, lots of areas to explore with this. Who benefits financially? You know, as I said, that what incentive is there to change or make all porn more ethical? Well, you know, there's a lot of money out there to be made. Maybe not in the same way that there was for the people who actually feature in porn, because so much of it is free. But certainly the porn industry executives and the satellite companies, if you're looking at adult videos or adult channels or stuff on uh, through pay-per-view, Microsoft, of course, all that accounting, the graphic design software, you know, it's big, the search engines, you know, I was saying to you, 25% of all searches are for pornography, that means search engines are making money from that, the property, you know, where they make the films, uh, and also the banks where all the money is invested. So some of that, the darker side, I suppose, is links to organized crime and maybe to exploitation and human trafficking. So definitely needs to be borne in mind. But the big money spinners within porn are not necessarily the, the porn artists themselves or those actors in terms of paid actors, which is probably why there's been a rise in things like ethical and homemade porn, where at least perhaps people are gonna make some more money out of it including things like, you know, keep looking at the being told that the image has changed and there's some images there. Um, in the last month, um, Larry Flint, who started Hustler magazine, uh, which was kind of like um, a bit like Playboy magazine. So Paul Barron, he was considered at one stage. And that old school image of him there is a very elderly man in a, in a wheelchair, but still surrounded by glamorous beauty. Uh, and that idea of it being a men's only club, you know, that's something that guys did that looked at magazines, that has changed a lot. You know, these are the Playboy buddies from the 70s there, the Playboy Club in London. So the image has changed quite considerably about pornography, but have the ethics themselves. And, and that was something I was quite interested in looking at and discussing uh, with colleagues and, and also with young people too around the, the, the ethics behind it around can you really have it you know can people take back control of their bodies and this is one way that seems to have, have split the vote as well you know only fans uh, is a, a site that is not just for pornography most definitely not you know there are people like jamie oliver and all sorts of people have got um, their own uh, stream where you can go on there, you get some free pictures that you can see, then if you sign up for membership, you pay and you get to see more. However, there are concerns uh, and you can see the front page there, the standard uh, that was um, at the beginning of this year, that was around that as brothels have had to close and um, that, you know, sex workers are not getting the work that they were, that they are maybe turning to OnlyFans and using that to take back control, you know, to have some control over their life. They're, they're setting their own agenda. They choose the film, they make the footage, they take the pictures and they load and share the content and live stream what they want to. So in terms of ethics, some people would say, well, hey, look, this is the people in charge take, taking control of it. And certainly there was a lot of talk about big money 
you know, saying that you could, you know, you can make as much as thirty thousand pounds a month. Um, and one film clip I saw was of a young woman in her mid twenties who said she's paid for her house outright through her fans only members. And you know that sounds great. And maybe that's one of the concerns. Uh, BBC Three again, uh, the news for sale, which is quite worth watching if you've got an hour to put aside, was looking at there are concerns that it's not just over 18s that are managing to access this because you can easily get around the age verification. It's also under 18s who are hearing this message and thinking, I can particularly young women can make easy money out of this. And of course, that is, is an issue around whether they can be exploited from there too. So definitely worth having a look at that. And, and also that that stuff is not just staying on OnlyFans, but is also going across onto Snapchat and Twitter. And, and uh, you know, from there can be screenshot or used and losing control quickly of that control that you'd taken back. So definitely having a look at that and those websites and actually even Instagram itself is, is worth looking at in terms of sexualized images. And I've got to bring up the music business because uh, at, there's always something to talk about there. Once again, nothing new. The term rock and roll is slang for sex. You know, if I say I want to rock with you all night long, what am I really saying? Most teenagers get it and have done since the advent of rock and roll. You know, we know what we're talking about. So what's the big deal that with the video age, actually the pictures now reflect uh, the words and maybe words are more explicit. And as Cardi B would say, she is owning it. You know, she is taking that, her body, which is beautiful, and those other beautiful women and talented artists, and are there they are owning their own bodies. And what is the problem? You know, they're saying this is a feminist masterpiece. If you haven't seen the uh, WAP video, have a look at it um, and see what you think. You know, there, there are two schools of thoughts here. One is, yeah, absolutely, this is about owning it yourself. This is about owning your own body, which you can do what you like with, and using those images. This is a celebration of female sexuality. And others saying, no, nah, it's not. All this is actually exploitation. This is around taking what was the male gaze um, and misogyny and just reflecting it into women reflecting that male gaze. What is empowering about that? So it depends who you read, you know, Russell Brand had a bit of a rant about it and then got vilified for that. Uh, other people are like, go, you go, go, you know, you've got it all going on there. You, you own those images. But Cardi B even herself said, I wouldn't want my daughter seeing this, but let's not forget before that's used as a headline, her daughter is under the age of five. So quite clearly she probably wouldn't. So it's interesting asking young people, what do they think? You know, the lyrics to that is sexually explicit, but so are many lyrics. Does it matter? Is it empowering? Is it not? Is it just taking that template of what we've seen about male exploitation and the misogyny of women uh, and repeating it? Or is it actually freeing? Or should we be celebrating it as female emancipation? And then we come to ethical porn. Now, I was really interested in looking at, at this term and, and thinking, you know, can there be such a thing as feminist or ethical porn? And certainly looking at, you know, it's defined as porn that's made legally, it respects the rights of the performance, it, it offers good working conditions and shows both fantasy and real world sex. So, you know, in terms of that, what is there not to like? Um, it shows consent, which of course is so important, and it's always one of the critic critics of, of pornography is that it doesn't necessarily show a, a consent, and it celebrates sexual diversity. You see, you know, it moves away from that heteronormative gaze, which so much porn is, and actually is sex for everybody there is seen. So this, I'm going to show you just a, um, an extract from a BBC uh, Three video that was made, um, and have a look at it. You might want to see the full thing which explains it a bit better about ethical porn what it is and what it's not what i wish i'd known about porn from the very beginning is how empowering and wonderful we can feel personally what i wish i'd known 
I fantasized about having a career in porn, but I never really thought realistically that would happen. I always felt a huge fascination for porn, uh, but I was raised as a second wave feminist, so I thought every kind of sex work, like pornography also, was a, a tool of the patriarchy to exploit women, and I thought that it was wrong. I did talk a lot with my mother about sex, for example, and she was always very open about it because she actually did give me the right values. She told me I should do whatever I want, um, only she wouldn't think that what I wanted to do is porn. <laughs> Every now and then I would try to put a fit in the industry, but everything that I would find was not, didn't really feel safe. So I once went to a, to a webcam studio and I once tried to apply for like a sex telephone job. But the people working there that I encountered did not give me the feeling that I would be in control of everything that was happening. So I didn't feel safe enough to do it. I think that is a contradiction, right? Like we, when we're talking about feminism or we're talking about them, so interesting. Have a look at it because, you know, I've cut it short there. Can porn be feminist? Is it anti-feminist? Have a look because that, that particular film is about seven and a half, eight minutes long. So it's ideal for youth work, really. Um, it's, it's intended for teenagers and it shows a different side maybe to the argument that we usually hear about somebody who's celebrating it. Uh, and, you know, looking at the two sides of the argument here, definitely within ethical porn, as I say, less focus on heteronormative sex, which has got to be a good thing. It's a wider range of bodies. It, it recognises female pleasure and female sexuality. And arguably, because it's a more equal platform, feminist porn allows women to take control of their body and how it's seen, and they are more able to say what they want, all of which is part of the national curriculum, you know, getting young people to be able to say what they want, what they don't want, understanding the meaning of real meaning of, of consent. However, the other side would say, look, it can influence young people's expectations about sex. And give some you know things that are perhaps not normal sex is 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 whatever that might be uh but stuff that would have been seen as quite niche because of porn and the overexposure of porn that, that young people are thinking well that's normal everybody does that and that can itself shape sexual sexual practices and there is an association there with unsafe sexual health practices because even in ethical porn you don't really see them having the, co the conversation about you know have you got any condoms no where are, well i've got one in my handbag well there's one in the drawer. you know you don't see them having that negotiation um and also there's people saying yeah but it still reinforces those gender stereotypes so you know there is a lot of views going both ways but that's quite a good starting point some people will say no definitely not harmful and, and Dr. Anne Francis Watson has been very vocal on this and, and her take on it is, look, you know, sex is sex and porn is just fantasy made visual. And there are plenty of good people out there who have high powered jobs, who don't have high powered jobs, are just normal people, very healthy. They have deeply disturbing fantasies and it doesn't matter because they understand the difference between what's real and what isn't. You know, if everybody who watched porn thought that that was exactly like real life, we'd have a problem with her words, paraphrased. So interesting to look at what she says. And then other people say, you've got Dr. Megan Tyler, who's been very vocal on the other side, saying, look, problem is, there's the culture we live in is a culture where violence against women is still a, a serious problem. And although pornography doesn't actually create the problem or cause the problem, it kind of reflects, because of the high, high rates of violence and aggression in porn, it reflects the problem and glamorizes it and makes it erotic. So therefore, it's not helping things at all. And her view is, it is harmful. So, you know, again, looking at both sides of the argument and exploring, um, it just brings up lots of questions. So there there was a sexualization of young people's review, which was headed, uh, government sponsored, uh, headed by Dr. Linda Papadopoulos. And that was um, a little while ago, um, maybe 2012, 2014, but still worthy of looking at. You know, I very much was talking about it's also around the culture that young people live in, that there is a lot of hypersexualized images and there is a lot of push for young people and children to look sexy and hot which means there are pressures on children that there weren't before. And as they grow older, that imagery leads to hyper body 
uh, surveyors are critical of your own body and those of others, which in turn leads to poor body satisfaction and, you know, risk factors for low self-esteem, depression and, and even eating disorders. So actually, we need to go right back to where we've, we're looking at creating this hypersexualized images in the media, in adverts, in music and starting there challenging some of this because children definitely do not have to look hot so have a look at that and then other people have gone on and looked about okay how could porn influence young people's expectations of their own body and, and how could that possibly impact on the type of sex they might want to have um, and the type of intimate relationships they might want to have. And some of again, uh, you know, doing activities. And there's some free downloads on this, actually, if you want to have a look on, on my website, so www.vanessarogers.co.uk, that, that has these um, activities on there. All of them are activities within um, the We Need to Talk About Porn book, uh, looking at getting them to talk about this. And some of the clear things that came out from all the kind of focus groups that I got to try out these things was that how it impacts, particularly on young men, is around the size and shape of their penis. Uh, this idea that the average penis is sort of nine inches long, it's not. You know, in the UK, it's between four or five inches fine. You know, what you've got is fine. How long an erection lasts, body hair or lack of it. And there is a whole section, if you go onto the NHS, there is a whole section that's made for young men, uh, for teenagers who are worried about their body that explains all sorts of stuff around how long an erection lasts, what's normal, what's not, and clarifying, you know, some penises do bend to the left or the right, and that's perfectly normal because some of those images that young people are getting from porn is giving them real grief when they're looking at themselves and being hyper judgmental. Muscle tone, you know, having to explain to really young boys of sort of nine or ten, eight or nine, you won't have a six pack, mate, because you haven't gone through puberty yet. And it's the hormones in puberty that enable your muscles to build in that way. And um, you can be fit and healthy. And that's a good thing to strive for. But at age six, you're not going to have a six pack, you know, considering and worrying about yourself. For young women, there was lots of talk about the shape and size of breasts, about what was considered desirable. Um, and things like even down to, you know, having long hair was more sexy and more feminine and you're going to be more sexually attractive. That idea of the designer vagina. And if you haven't seen it already, have a look at there is an installation artwork called The Wall of Vaginas, which is really good to look at. It, it is hundreds of, of um, plaster casts of different vaginas, all different sizes and shapes all of which are perfectly normal. And uh, if you're watching you know, TV and want to look at something, uh, Channel 4 has done something called 100 Vaginas, which includes um, trans women as well as women and girls. Uh, I think they must be all be over 18. They will be all over 18. Um, but look at there because it's great. It's a photographer who, who um, is female too, and it is a celebration of the female form. Uh, and pointing out actually it's their vulvas, not their vaginas that she's photographing. But anyway, it's a hundred and again, pushing that message that everything is normal. Um, and there is a one for a photographer who's done the same called 100 Penises. So both Channel 4, both worth taking a look. Obviously, with any of this stuff, you know the young people you work with and the age and how appropriate it is for them. Check it out first and then see if there's stuff you can use out there. You know, we don't need to be reinventing the wheel. Now this is on the national curriculum. There will be stuff out there for us to, to use. OK, so... This is a short video. It's, it's, uh, it's fairly old, actually, but I have used it quite a lot just to get over the, that um, message that porn bodies and real life bodies and behaviour can be quite different. It uses fruit and vegetables, so there's nothing here that anybody can't see. Um, I'll show you. Porn is different from sex in real life. Let's find out how. Porn star penises are six to nine inches. Civilian penis, five to seven. And while porn stars have very little hair down there, in real life, 65% of women and 85% of men do. 
Indeed, female porn privates tend to sport a similar look. But real-world vaginas come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. As for arousal, real people need 10 to 12 minutes to get going, while porn stars... Male performers can hump for days, but in real life, 75% of men ejaculate within three minutes. And though porn starlets seem to always have an orgasm through penetration alone, 71% of women don't. Now what about all the other stuff? Unlike porn stars, only 11.5% of women have had a same-sex experience. And only 40% of women have tried anal. Just 22% say they'll take a hot load in the face. And only 30% will actually swallow said load. The portion of women who've been in a threesome is less than 20%. And while the internet is awash in female squirters, only 6% of women say they regularly gush forth. Finally, what about light bondage? Well, only 40% have tried it. Wait, that's actually quite a lot. Mm. So there you go. That's the difference between porn sex and real sex. Feeling hungry? So again... <laughs> You know, it's just something, another way to get young people thinking about things and to clarify a few bits and pieces. It, it's not going to offend anybody, that particular video, but it is worth thinking about. Within school, you may well have heard uh, some of the debates around whether or not we should be even talking about pornography and some people, parents feeling very strongly that we shouldn't be. Um, so whereas in school, there is the national curriculum, you know, parents have the right to withdraw their children from sex education. Um, we need to have a think about whether you need to be informing parents uh, and that will depend on, you know, where you work, who you work with and your own protocols. So have a think about that. And certainly, you know, it should be stuff that we can, if parents do want to know what we're doing or what we're looking at, that we can use that template of the national curriculum to at least outline what it is we're covering. Okay, so talking about porn versus reality and certainly having those conversations with young people. And while some were quite clear it's a fantasy only, there was an acceptance that sometimes that fantasy, even if you think it isn't having an effect or an impact on, on your behavior or what you think, it does. So, you know, young people saying, I think young people expect sex to be like porn and measuring how good they are or how good the sex is by if it's like that. You know, if it didn't work out that way or it didn't happen that way, then we weren't having proper sex. You know, we didn't do it right. And sometimes that can come across as that, you know, quite um, either young people owning that and thinking I'm useless, you know, I don't, I was no good in bed or labeling themselves or labeling others. And of course there's that other side that, you know, if you did, if you did do it or you did, did emulate what you'd seen that somehow, you know, that's not good either. And you get called names for that too. So very much around double standards there. And, one, one, one focus group that I did, we were looking at the impact, uh, and these were young, young women at risk or young women who were identified as maybe having been in inappropriate relationships or, or not had great relationships so far. And I was quite surprised by what they were saying that they felt that a lot of it, it kind of makes male fantasies come true or boys fantasies come true. And then they think that's what the sex is supposed to be like. And the whole thing becomes a bit aggressive and they're not really connecting with you. It, they've still got that porn image in the head. And I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and a few young people were very honest and said, no, actually, if I'm honest, I prefer porn. It's easier. And I don't even have to think about somebody else. I don't have to uh, lead up to it. I don't have to get to, you know, it's just something, if I feel horny, I can go up to my bedroom and I can just watch it on my phone and it's done. Um, and then that led on to conversations about where is appropriate. Um, there was a, a little while ago, you may have read, there was an article about a man who was on a crowded, I'm sure he wasn't the only one, but on a crowded bus in rush hour, 
in one of our city centres. He was watching porn on his iPad while he was squeezed in next to an older woman. Then there was other people behind it and they could all see what he was watching. And the question, you know, one of them complained to the bus driver and the bus driver took that complaint and somebody phoned the police. And actually the feeling was, well, he hasn't really done anything wrong. It's inappropriate maybe, but he hasn't actually done anything wrong. And talking, using that as a, as a way into talking about where's appropriate, where's not. What do you think about watching porn? If porn is, the, the purpose of porn is to sexually arouse and to fulfill sexual desire, how does that, how does that work in a public space? You know, um, so then there were girls who were saying, well, you can tell if a boy watches a lot of porn by the things he wants to do and that he thinks are normal, which I thought was interesting. But alongside that, within the LGBTQ groups that I work with, a lot of talk about, well, where else? There isn't anywhere else for me to learn about sex. That I did, uh, that was my sex education because I wasn't getting that in school. And I didn't know, you know, how you were supposed to have sex. I didn't know what I was, what was supposed, I knew what I wanted, but I didn't know how you did that or any of the details. So being able to watch that was really good for me and really informative for me. And I think that's another important area that maybe youth work could be great at doing is inclusive um, RSE. It's on the national curriculum now. But some teachers are saying we haven't had the training. And I guess looking at lockdown, you know, this the new RSE curriculum should have come in last September. We've been in school lockdown. They're now trying to catch up on some of the other su subjects that the national curriculum says they've got to teach. I think this is a great space for youth workers to step forward. I think we could do loads of good work in this. So, you know, having to think about that too, that for some people it's the only place that they feel in the past they've been able to learn. And that issue of consent is so important. Um, we know that there's more need, more emphasis to be looking at that within the SRE that we do with young people, RSE, sorry, with young people. Um, and, and actually understanding, somebody was talking the other day about informed consent should be linked to desire that you actively want to do this, not that you know, like, do you want peace with your tea? Yes or no, that's consent. But it's not quite the same thing, you know, active, actively, active consent linked with desire and around wanting to be with that person, feeling safe, feeling trusted, feeling respected, all that stuff, which is likely to uh, have mean that you have better sex anyway you know and that old idea of mutual pleasure very concerning particularly talking to some young women who are going ahead with things maybe things you know that their boyfriends have seen in porn maybe things they've seen in porn but not enjoying it and maybe even saying well that's why I drink beforehand I you know I get drunk so I can't feel it and it's almost like Victorian England having to go hang on a minute no you know, you have a right to, to pleasure too. And if it's not pleasurable, you really need to be thinking about whether you should be doing it. You know, mutual pleasure, mutual respect is really important. And that underlying thing that if it's not consensual, it's sexual assault or rape, you know, it's not okay. And somebody just not saying no is never good enough. Um, and I guess that when we look, you know, at porn, it doesn't show that side so much. Ethical porn, which is certainly why people say that that's better. Problem with ethical porn is the bit is that it costs money. A bit like the early days of being able to go buy organic vegetables three times. A, you know, if there is a whole wealth of porn out there that's free of charge. Who's going to be paying for it? Yes, if you feel strongly enough and, and ethical porn is, is what you want to do. But I'm suspecting that for some young people, being a part of the fun of this is that it's free. And so the likelihood is that they're not accessing the, the ethical porn. But we shall see in time. And again, we need to be looking at this and around when we're talking about porn and making it clear that if it's if it's paid porn actors they will have health checks regular screenings yes they might not show them using condoms although actually some um 
porn does show if it's uh, male on male anal sex some porn does show um uh, condoms use but often it doesn't that's kind of it's fantasy so maybe you know condoms don't come into most people's fantasies i don't know um but actually in real life that negotiation has to take place and it should take place before you have that sex and all you know contraception is discussed as well so that not only you know protected against unwanted pregnancy but also around stis and having a think about that early on and we need to be getting that message across that just because it's not talked about in porn doesn't mean to say it doesn't happen and that they have regular checks and screenings to make sure that people have safer sex and at the end of the day, I guess it's over to that discussion when we've heard all the arguments and we've heard all the which, you know, either side and we've explored body image and we've then had a think about the impact it might have on mental health uh, and certainly around, you know, you, you can find research that supports the fact that people who watch too much pornography get desensitized. You can read other things that say that's total nonsense. There is so much stuff out there that actually you can end up going down rabbit holes for whole days, just looking at both sides of the argument, getting young people to have a think about it. And, and ultimately, is it about empowerment? You know, things like the, the, the rappers there, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, that whole, is that owning your body? Is it feminist? Is it not? Is, can any porn be truly ethical? Is it okay to watch porn? Does it impact on you? And, you know, at the end of the day, this whole idea that you should be good enough of who you are, that in a positive relationship is built on trust, mutual respect, uh, and that honesty, and actually within that, all those agreements come into play too, and you are less likely to be harmed there. So interesting conversations to have. As I say, there's a lot of information out there. Conclusions I drew were, well, we do need to talk about the impact of porn with young people. And I think youth workers are really well placed to do that. Whether you believe it has no impact or it has loads of impact, still have the conversation. And they can affect some of those decisions whilst they're not directly responsible. Certainly messages picked up around body image and about what you're supposed to look like and what you're supposed to be doing can have an influence on the decisions that are made about sex and relationships. I guess both ways in that it can be empowering in that you take ownership of what you want to do, but also around maybe doing things that you're not comfortable with just because you think that you should. Um, and it's not just those unrealistic expectations on other people, it's also on yourself in terms of what you look like and maybe celebrating going down that far more of the body positive movement around feeling good about who you are and what you are and, and striving for a healthy, strong body rather than trying to fit unrealistic images or perhaps ideals that are perpetrated through porn. And youth work is the ideal you know, vehicle for doing that because if young people feel confident, happy and secure, they're likely to make healthier choices that are based on what they really want and um, with true consent. Okay, uh, if you want more stuff, there is loads out there. That's the book we need to talk about pornography that I wrote, which is actually currently being updated, which is why I seem to be talking about porn all the time again. Um, but also, if you want to know how this fits within the national curriculum and around the other stuff around LGBTQ, about inclusive SRE, uh, RSC, I keep saying it the wrong way around today, I'm so sorry. Um, and also about things like what they learn in primary school, what they learn in secondary school, faith-based schools, the whole stuff. It's really accessible. The Sex Ed Diaries podcast, uh, supported by Brooke. It's really very good. Uh, Dr. Polly Haste hosts it, and she has a whole load of youth workers and teachers and different sexual health organisations talking. Definitely worth listening. Can be uh, downloaded from any kind of place you get your usual podcasts. So have a think about it. Uh, and certainly go and explore. So I'm just going to come back to you just to round off. Well, 
that has been a busy hour and I have put loads of stuff out there. As I say, the more I discuss, the more I look into this, the more I find. There is some really interesting arguments both ways. And, but the first thing I would say is work out where you stand in the argument, because if you're clear on your own values and ethics, it's a lot easier. And don't make assumptions because actually people that you work with might have different ones. So certainly I've had great conversations with other youth workers. Uh, some are very pro-porn, some are very anti, and some are in the middle. And that's okay. We don't have to agree on this, but actually having the tools, the techniques, and ideas to talk to young people about this, get it out in the open, have those conversations. Um, and inform young people so that they can make those informed decisions and choices for themselves. Okay, thanks for listening. It's been really good being with you this morning, and hopefully I'll see you all again sometime. Take care. Bye.